I, I've always believed the number one thing is modeling <laughs> by example. I think that today's age, sometimes the adults can be as bad as the students in how they interact online. And our kids watch that. Our kids see that. Same thing in person, obviously. They, kids are going to mock the behavior that they see of their parents a lot of times or community members. I think that first one we always tell parents is really just you set the example. You be the one that kind of helps guide your students through that social media river, if you will. I think in high school and middle school, particularly, you know, never that we want kids to mess up, but that's also a good place, I think, for learning experiences for students that have maybe less consequences sometimes than when they get out into, if you will, over the age of 18 sometimes. Yeah. I think having some of those experiences where parents can come side by side and help them navigate some of those pitfalls of social media. You're listening to the smartsocial.com podcast. I'm your host, Josh Oaks. This is our district talk segment where we interview district leaders to learn how they're keeping students safe on social media so those students can someday shine online. Now, let's get back to the interview. So my name is Jeff McCoy. I'm the Associate Superintendent for Academics here in Greenville County School, South Carolina. We are just under 80,000 students now in about 104 total locations. It's so great to have you here on the podcast. We've got a lot of questions for you here today, Jeff, because we want to inspire other district leaders, other parents, other principals, how we can run the best organization that serves students so they can launch into their future so that when they're 25 years old, they're employable, they're resilient, they're ready for the real world. They're using these devices, these Ferraris that are iPhones and Androids that we give them. They're using them in a way that helps them get to point A to point B and also make sure that they're social awesome people that we're all trying to raise them. So I'm excited that you're here today. My first question for you, Jeff, is as a district, what's your biggest accomplishment at the district over the past one to four years? So I think the last one to four years really for us and our team have worked really hard. Our principals, our teachers have worked really hard on pandemic recovery. Um, everybody took a hit during the pandemic um, just because of a lot of disruption and interruptions to um, learning and education. So very proud of our principals and our teachers, really, and our students too. Obviously, they're doing the work. And so I, really, we are now back at, and in most cases have exceeded, our pre-pandemic test scores in almost every subject. So our last three years have been great for us and to really double down on those things we know that work for kids to bring them back to where we need to have them level-wise and achievement. Yeah, that's so important and good for you. I feel like that was a big hurdle for many districts, and we're all still working on making sure these kids are as resilient and awesome as possible. It was not easy for all, what all, they all went through. Now, the next question I have for you is, what advice do you have for other school districts to possibly deal with social media issues that it may originate on a social media app, but then creates a very real problem on campus? So that is probably one of the biggest issues I think districts deal with uh, plaguing around the country these days. Um, it's very easy for that stuff to spill over into school. Um, and and for, unfortunately, sometimes, certainly when that does happen, we do need to deal with it from a safety standpoint um, and from a, you know, a character education standpoint as well, if you will. I think we've tried to really invest heavily into some of the um, anti-bullying campaigns that we do with students. That's so important to do now, not just physical, but it's also to do online, given the online presence of all of our students these days. And really building that not just as a once a year lesson, but really trying to build that into on the demand lessons, if you will, when teachers or other students, even staff members see something happening, taking that moment to really address the behavior. And when possible, I think address the root cause. We are very fortunate in Greenville, we put something in place called On Track. On Track is an intervention system where any teacher can refer students, but it's also kicked off by attendance behavior and course grades, so the ABCs. But that's something if we see happening, a student being bullied or somebody bullying a student, we can send them through that on track process. And really the interventions there are unlimited. That could be outside community support that student may end up getting. That can be in, inside the school. Every child that goes through that process actually gets a mentor. And so an adult in the building doesn't have to be a teacher. It could be a custodian, a cafeteria worker, someone who's built a relationship with that student to really hopefully intervene with the behavior and kind of make sure that child has someone they're comfortable talking to and has been able to build a relationship with. So I think those things are key. I think that we know, and we've said for years, our focus has been on relationships. We know the better relationships we have with students, that cuts back on a lot of the discipline and behavioral issues we have across the board. That's really neat. What you just said about every kid gets a mentor. Absolutely love that. What a great way to say it. 
The next question I have for you, Jeff, is can you provide some examples of how your students may have used their social media in a positive or productive way that may have benefited themselves or their community? Once a month, our superintendent meets with something here called the Inner High Council. The Inner High Council for us is a group of two to four students per high school. So we have 15 high schools total in our districts. Anywhere between 60 and 80 students come together monthly. They meet with our superintendent and our chiefs, if you will, our district leadership at senior level and executive level. And they give input on all kinds of things. But several years in a row, they actually have done during the anti-bullying weeks, they've actually done kindness campaigns where they actually have led the initiatives in their school. So they actually are the ones coming up with the activities. They're promoting it on social media. They're making sure those kids in the lunchroom that don't have a buddy actually feel welcome and have a buddy in the lunchroom smiling up to them, actually being a friend um, on that. So this, some of the best ideas obviously have come from students. Um, themselves. And these are some very bright young people that recognize also that bullying can be an issue sometimes. And so using their social media presence, not just their social media, but social media presence for good, if you will, to promote um, kindness, anti-bullying, and some of the things that are going on in the school that are really good. I like that where this question leads you because it's not all about just negative. There's so many things that these digital tools can be used for so the next thing I'd love for, to get advice from you on is what suggestions do you have, Jeff, for parents to encourage their kids to use technology in a positive way, both in the classroom and at home? So I, I've always believed the number one thing is modeling, <laughs> by example. I think that today's age, sometimes the adults can be as bad as the students in how they interact online. And our kids watch that. Our kids see that. Same thing in person, obviously. They, kids are going to mock the behavior that they see of their parents a lot of times or community members. I think that first one we always tell parents is really just you set the example. You be the one that kind of helps guide your students through that social media river, if you will. I think in high school and middle school particularly, you know, never that we want kids to mess up. But that's also a good place, I think, for learning experiences for students that have maybe less consequences sometimes than when they get out into, if you will, over the age of 18 sometimes. Yeah. I think having some of those experiences where parents can come side by side and help them navigate some of those pitfalls of social media. It was funny. We just had this conversation in Chicago with a group of parents. I was there for an event this past week, and they were talking about at what age should they give their kids social media and cell phones. And it was very greatly. But I think the point that ultimately came out of that was if we don't give kids access to that and give them some trust, how are we actually going to teach them what's right and wrong and let them navigate that and make some mistakes in a safe environment? You bring up so many good points there. People all over, people listening to this, watching this episode will agree, especially the district leaders. People have varying degrees of my kids will never get social media and others, hey, they're 11 and they've, they've got it because I'm monitoring it. And there's no right or wrong uh, question or answer, but typically letting them make failures in your home, at school, calculated blunders is so good. I think everybody agrees with that. Let's try it now. Just like in math homework. Hey, you get the problem wrong. How'd you come to that? How, do you think that's right? Let's find, and they find their right way in a safe space, if you will. So great. Okay, Jeff, the next question I have for you is a two prompt question, if you will. What are your suggestions for other school districts to increase parent engagement? And are there any specific channels or events that get the biggest turnout for that parent engagement? We always tell our schools and our principals that really capitalize on those events that they're holding at school. Anytime a child is in a play, in a musical, in a, a band concert, whatever, parents are going to show up and grandparents to actually see the student in that play. But I also think involving parents in many of our schools have tried to involve parents more even into the education side, really leaning heavily on parents who are in business, parents who are in certain industry. We're very big on project-based learning. So actually inviting those parents in as experts in the industry, so to speak, to be work side by side with our students in, the, in those classrooms on projects. So I think it's also finding some of the unique ways to bring parents in non-traditional, if you will, not just coming in for a play, not just coming in to engage, but actually to have some meaningful input and impact on education. High school for us tends to be the hardest. Parents at that point are trying to give some some autonomy to students, so they aren't quite as engaged sometimes, not right or wrong. They just tend to let their students kind of start getting some autonomy as they go off to college and career. And so sometimes that's where it's a little bit harder to engage, where we're looking at with some of our schools, with project-based learning is actually bringing those parents in to have expert advice and expert in field to say, hey, would you come in and work with a group of students on X or on this project, given your industry expertise? Yeah, I love what you just said. It hits, it hits home with so many districts right now. 
about the capitalizing on performances, capitalizing on the combined events that some super assistant superintendents, associate superintendents, and superintendents are saying, hey, we've got these recitals, choir practice, everything else. I absolutely love that. I think it's great. Okay, we're coming up here on the hottest question everybody has. It's our final question of the podcast. We're going to get to it in just a sec. Before we do that, I want to give a big shout out to our dozens and dozens of school districts that are helping us reach millions of students with our program, our parent engagement program. Shout out to the many districts in 29 states that are using our program to engage parents, putting our modules into those combined performances and combined parent events, those recitals, like, hey, parents, for the first five minutes while your kids are backstage practicing, we're gonna watch a TikTok safety video led by students, for students and parents. And there's a, a cheat sheet on your, uh, there's a piece of paper that was on your, your chair when you came in and it has elementary school, middle school and high school key takeaways on dialogue starters. Thank you to the districts that are doing that, that are engaging our army of parents doing the research. We've heard from you. We've adjusted it. Your new dashboard is built out. It is incredible. And we're so grateful for the lives that we're changing, the parents we're engaging, and the new student dashboard is in there. So thank you to everybody. We're so excited what we can do in the 24-25 school year to do some incredible stuff. All right, we're back to Jeff. My last question for you, the hottest question on everybody's mind is we have all heard about these new high-tech tools. And we're all using them in some case. Some people really dislike them. No, my kids aren't allowed to use them. It's only cheating. Some people are going, actually, this is really interesting. And it's the new way that we can teach students and tutor them. With that in mind, how is your school district approaching AI tools like ChatGPT? So Josh, we jumped on this pretty quickly when ChatGPT came out in 22. Actually, the event I was in Chicago last week, I was cheering the National Council for Innovative Instructional Leaders, which brought together 50, 60 instructional leaders from around the country. And this is the topic we discussed for three days, was AI and how schools are implementing it and sharing the best practices. Um, Greenville, back in the spring, we actually released a position statement from the senior leadership, um, from the superintendent and, and uh, those of us on his um, cabinet or his senior leadership team. Um, in that position statement's about it page and a half, but it, if you read through that, it actually embraces AI. It encourages um, schools and staff and districts to embrace AI, use it ethically, use it responsibly, use it with guardrails, but that we expect people to embrace it. And the biggest reason for that is we have something in Greenville called Graduation Plus that was started 10 years ago by our superintendent, where by the time a grad student graduates, we expect them to have not just their diploma, not just to graduate, but to actually have six hours of college credit and or career certification. And Right now, last year, we had 75% of our students graduating with that, that honor, if you will, that graduation plus honor with the goal of 100%. So when we, had to, when we started looking at AI and ChatGBT and those tools, it was something that came to light very quickly when we started pulling our industry partners and everybody to say, look, this is what they're going to use when they come out of high school. Yeah. And so if we are, our goal as school districts is to prepare students for the future, AI is really not something we can ignore. So we released that position statement. We spent this year training our teachers on ChatGBT and Magic School just to get them comfortable with AI. And then we're looking at now, how do we build this into the curriculum? Do we open ChatGBT now for students? Again, 13 and up, we only do it for certain ages, obviously. But really looking at how do we build those AI tools? And honestly, it's opening up conversations right now about transforming some of the stuff we do. I do believe it's a catalyst that will make us force change in education, how we do business. And we're having those conversations now about some of the things we used to teach and how we teach them. Do we still need to teach them the same way or are they even as relevant anymore because of the tools like AI that we have access to? I think those are all reasonable questions and, and right in line with the other 118 superintendents and associate superintendents we've had on the podcast. It's These are the tools of the future. And Jeff, you and I both remember a day when, or even stories about, hey, you're now, the teachers would say, you need to learn all, and I do agree that math, We, I think we all agree. I'm going to speak for everybody here. Students should know math, the back of the napkin math really well because you're better or smarter. You should know how to spell because uh, really well because it does make you better at everything. Communication is key and mathematics is key. But at the same time, when you're running really advanced thing, we do have a calculator in our pocket at all times. We have a supercomputer better than the Apollo 11. Or, but I think AI, we all agree, is going to be the new thing. It's not going to replace jobs. It's going to, people who know how to use it are going to replace people who don't. And it's as simple as if 20 years ago, everybody said, I'm never going to learn Excel or Microsoft Word or Google Sheets, then I need to put somebody in here that does want to learn that. 
right? I need to put somebody in here that can move data and help us analyze things. And I think that's the future for students, whether they're entrepreneurial or going into a company or anything else, they need to be able to analyze, use the new tools. It doesn't make them lazy. It just makes them be able to, I think, build things faster. Would you agree, Jeff? I do agree with that. I think when districts are discussing banning or versus not banning, those tools. I think the biggest issue for me that we have to consider as leaders is equity. We know our kids that have devices at home have access to chat GBT and everything else. The kids that may not, those kids in poverty don't have access to that. And so I think we have to weigh our decisions when we start talking about particularly chat GBT and AI. Are we creating, are we widening the equity gap by not allowing students to have access to it? So hundred percent agree with that, Josh. And I think it's a, a huge question right now in education. You can't go anywhere where that's not a question about what you're doing with chat GPT. Normally this would be the end of the podcast, but I think we go another minute because I think a lot of the really smart superintendents and district leaders are asking a different variation of what you just said, which is so good for the kiddos. What is on the best interest of the students in the long run? How do we provide those tools? Are we actually hurting those that we think that we're protecting by removing the tools and sending everybody to the bottom, a race to the bottom, as some of my congressional friends say. They're, we're creating a race to the bottom. Why are we pulling these back? Do they know the downstream? And if we're all truly fighting for the kiddos, it's how do we provide this? There is no black or white. There's gray zones, all of this, right? You said 13 plus. In some states, it may be different. Everything's a gray zone. Everything is a hurdle that we can overcome through dialogue and meetings and learning. There, no teacher should be left out of this discussion. No principal, every associate Thanks, superintendent Thanks. and district leader is, how are we going to figure this out? Absolutely an exciting time and still the Wild West. Would you agree, Jeff? Definitely agree with that. Yes. Yeah. Wild, Wild West. Hey, Jeff, this has been absolutely delightful. I really appreciate you being on the podcast today. Great conversation. Keep up the great work with your district. To the rest of you listening or watching anywhere in the world, we're smartsocial.com and I'm your host, Josh Oaks. I'm so grateful for your support and to the millions of students that are reached through our school district partners, through the engagement events and dashboards and all the incredible things. Thank you for your support and shout out to the dozens of people at Smart Social, the army of parents that does our research and helps to deploy meaningful, awesome dialogue starters around technology that builds a rich dialogue between parents and students so the school can do what they're trying to do to en enrich students, build resilient students, and parents can also be a part of that discussion. We're grateful for everybody. It is a village we're creating as we help to reach students everywhere. Thanks everyone for watching. As the title of my book says, remember to keep it light, bright, and polite because everything you're doing, your kids are watching. We'll see all of you on the next episode. Have a great day, everyone. Bye. Thanks for listening to our smartsocial.com podcast. I'm your host, Josh Oaks. This was our district talk segment where we interview school district leaders to learn how they're keeping students safe on social media so those students can someday launch into their future by shining online. This episode was brought to you by our smartsocial.com VIP program. It's called the Very Informed Parent Program, which helps you engage your students with teen-led video lessons. Stay one step ahead with our premium parent newsletter and discover hidden features on trending apps on teens' phones and our 54 plus live parent and student friendly events every single year. You can click on the link below to chat with one of our team members if you want a free pass to our VIP program to support your community with our smartsocial.com resources. And if you're a district leader who has a success story, we would love to feature you on a future episode. You can click the links below to reach out. Thanks so much for listening, and we look forward to seeing you on the next episode. Have a great day.